All right, Susan Weisbauer, welcome to the show. Thank you, glad to be here. Uh, so you have uh, written two books on classical education. You're a big advocate for classical education. I think most people who are listening have heard of the phrase, heard of the term, the idea, might have a vague idea of what it entails. But can you explain to us what exactly a classical education is and how it differs from the education that most people have gotten if they went through public schools? Sure, sure. So uh, this has several steps to it. So bear with me for just a minute. Um, I think, uh, you know, particularly if you tend to be, you know, a watcher of PBS or, or you read, you know, British mystery novels or something, um, you sort of identify the phrase classical education with an education that, you know, maybe you got at Oxford and that had lots of Latin and Greek, um, particularly Latin attached to it. That uh, traditionally has been part of what a classical education is, but there's much more to classical education. Classical education was actually a pattern. It was sort of a sequence of training the mind, of learning how to think. And, and there were traditionally three phases to this education. Um, and we call these three phases the trivium. And this is based, by the way, in, in the development of the medieval university, this particular style of learning. So the first part of the trivium, the, the grammar uh, stage, has to do with learning the basics of a subject. So grammar means the basics, the foundational information in any one subject. It doesn't just mean English. That's sort of gotten associated with, with English in our minds. But grammar is just, you know, the, the basic terms and principles of any subject. Then the second phase in a classical education is called the logic phase. And that's when you take all that information and you start to think critically about it. You start to think analytically about it. You decide whether or not it's valid and why and whether or not you agree with it. And then the third stage or phase of classical education is called the rhetoric stage. And that's when you begin to speak back to what you're learning. You begin to put it into your own frame of reference. You, you decide how to incorporate it into your own way of thinking. You talk about it. You develop this fluency in speech and in writing that allows you to take the information you accumulated and your analysis of it and express it in your own way. So that pattern of classical education, to me, is much more definitive of what a classical education is than the inclusion of Latin or Greek. Um, sometimes I like to call this actually neoclassical education because I think in our modern application of a classical education, we tend to put more emphasis on that sort of three-stage process of training the mind rather than on specifically Latin, which was one of the fields in which students learned how to practice this process, you know, first they absorbed all this Latin grammar, and then they learned all of the principles and rules that governed how to put sentences together, and they learned how to decode Latin, how to read it. And then finally, they learned how to write, and, you know, in the 18th century in particular, maybe 19th too, they've learned actually how to speak Latin. So... Um, Today, it's often more useful for us to um, think about how this is practiced in science or in history than in Latin, but the principles are the same. Gotcha. And um, that was a long speech. No, I loved it. It was perfect, perfect uh, description of uh, encapsulating what you've written about. Um, but so how does that differ from the education that most people have gotten through public schools? You just mentioned there was a time, uh, even in American history, where a classical education was the pattern that schools used. But then there was a shift. Uh, why did that shift occur and what does it look like now? Right. Well, there's there's actually not one simple answer to this because you have to understand that when we talk about American education, we're talking about a vast, vast subject here. Because of the way that the U.S. is structured, um, states have much more say over how subjects are taught than, than the federal government. And even within states, local areas do school very differently. And then private schools have a whole different set of, of, of you know, things that they're trying to do. So I try not to use that phrase, American education. Um, but I will say that, that many public education systems were 
um, highly influenced by progressive learning early in the 20th century. And progressive learning tended to be very process-centered rather than um, knowledge-centered. So the entire focus was on understanding how a child's mind works and then giving information to the child in a way that sort of, you know, dovetailed into those particular mental processes. And the emphasis on actually learning information on facts, on knowledge, on this being the foundation and the basis of all learning really began to fall out of uh, many public education curricula. And, you know, I think the flaws to this kind of, of learning began to be apparent in the 60s and in the 70s and when it became clear that kids just weren't getting the basics. They weren't learning how to read. They didn't know how to do math. They didn't know anything about history. And so a sort of a reform movement began and really kind of hit its, hit its stride, actually, maybe, I don't know, 25 years ago or so, where the emphasis shifted on teaching children how to think critically, how to think analytically as a way to try to um, fix this problem. That we had, you know, all these kids who'd gone through public school and didn't seem to know anything that they were supposed to. There were two problems with that shift in emphasis. The first was that it didn't actually make up for the fact that there still wasn't a focus on what needs to be learned, on actual knowledge. And the second was that this critical and analytical thinking was often pushed all the way back in the curricula into the elementary grades, which is a time when most students are not ready to think critically and analytically. They really need to focus on learning the basics. So the critical thinking movement, in my opinion, didn't really go towards um, solving this, this problem of, I don't know, sort of basic illiteracy in the basics of, of the English language, in the basics of history, in the basics of science, you know, in the, in the core skills of, of um, mathematical thinking. So I think a lot of people who've been through the public school system realize that there's sort of this, um, they, they have this gap in their basic knowledge, that there's some foundational, um, well, just foundation, that foundation of basic training in the essential principles and facts of a field, that they're still kind of missing that. Right. And I think you referenced in the book that one of the, the consequences of this in the broader culture is that uh, we have a tendency in our population for people to make opinions about things, even when they might not know all the facts, because they were taught as a child or asked as a child in school, like, what do you think about this? Even though they didn't really know much about the thing they were supposed to have an opinion about. Yes, that's very true. We tend to leap directly to what is my opinion without taking the time to gather the facts and then to think critically about them. And, you know, this is this is always so painfully apparent in an election year um, when you read, uh, you know, you don't even have to go to to online forums, which, you know, show the worst argumentation of anything anywhere. You look at newspaper opinion columns, look at, you know, speeches made by political leaders, and you can see this, this leaping to form an opinion and to hold it very strongly without actually going back to find the facts and critically analyze them. It can be very depressing to watch. Right. And so this, this foundational knowledge, uh, I, I guess you could call it the great conversation, right? Uh, this sort of cultural literacy that we need to have in order to uh, engage in a conversation about big ideas, whether it's uh, in politics or philosophy or science, uh, po you know, public policy. Yeah, that's actually, that's a really interesting point, too. The use of that phrase, so the great conversation, this is a phrase that was originated in, I think, the 1940s by Mortimer Adler, um, who was an advocate of returning to what he called the great books, returning to the classics, and reading the classic works of history and literature and philosophy. And the reason why he called this the great conversation was because he, he believed, first of all, that when you read those books, you were having a conversation with these great minds of the past. But also it had to do with establishing this sort of um, this shared body of knowledge, this shared set of terms, this 
uh, these shared ideas. And once two people have common knowledge of an important concept or idea, and once two people are using the same terms to mean the same things, then they can have a conversation with each other until they, uh, otherwise they, you know, they're just talking past each other, which we see a lot of. So I wouldn't say that the great conversation is um, equivalent to, I mean, they're not, they're not exactly the same thing. They're not exactly parallel terms, but they're definitely related to each other. Right. I mean, I, one thing I've noticed with my own writing uh, with the the website that I have is that sometimes I'll throw in just these like references, these sort of cultural touchstones that, you know, that mean something beyond like, you know, crossing the Rubicon, for example. And I've had people like, what does that mean? And I have to go in, I have to sort of, I have to explain, you know, you know, the, his, the history behind it, then explain the, the, you know, the illusion that I'm trying to make by using that term. Uh but when people understand those type of phrases or those references, like you said, it makes the conversation a lot easier and more fluent. Yes. And, and you know, this is, not a, this is not a simple thing to sort of make up for um, if you haven't gotten it. So with your example, crossing the Rubicon, okay, it means making a decision that you can't turn back on. But if you know the original story, there's all of these implications that not only have you made a decision that you can't unmake, but that you're doing it with reluctance and you're doing it in a way that you're aware you're actually violating some of your own principles, but you feel not to do it would be more of a violation. There's sort of all these shades of meaning that enter into the use of these terms. And if you had gotten a classical education where you spent the early part of your life just learning these stories, mm -hmm. learning the history, learning the facts, you would have been able to suss that out later on in life. Yes, yes, I think so. I'm I mean, it, it's like learning. A, it's like learning a language. Learning a language takes a long time, you know, to do it well and to use it well. And uh, that's really what classical education is about. It's about um, learning, learning, learning the language of. I was going to say discourse. That sounds so college professor, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> lear, learning a language that that makes meaningful conversation possible. Right. But it just sounds so impossibly <laughs> idealistic in 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 the present political climate too. But I, I know there's a lot of people out there who they, they feel like they've missed out on that. Yeah. And now they're in their thirties, their forties, and they're thinking, I want to catch up. So how do you do that? Um, I mean, what's the best approach of uh, playing catch up to this great conversation uh, while using the, the pattern of a classical education to do that? Right. And that's such a great question because I think there's so many people in this, in this boat, as it were. Um, so the first book I did on classical education was called The Well-Trained Mind, and it was for parents to help train their kids. And I had so many parents after that book came out mm, 16 years ago now. It's gone, going into its fourth edition now. I've had so many parents come up to me and say, I am enjoying training my kids so much. If only I'd had this education, what can I do? So I did a second book called The Well-Educated Mind, which was basically sort of a guide for grown-ups to retrain themselves in these foundational skills. And the, the central way that you do it is to read, but to read in a very particular way, where, where as you read, you are practicing, first of all, gathering information, and then secondly, thinking critically about it. And then third, expressing your opinion. So you're, you're practicing these steps of grammar and logic and rhetoric. And one of the things I point out in the well-educated mind is that you don't have to think about giving yourself a classical education in terms of, now I have to go read the Iliad and the Odyssey. Because although these are great texts, um, you know, epic Poetry is not everyone's jam. That's not necessarily the way you're going to think. Uh, a lot of people do better with nonfiction, with reading great works of history or great works of science. What's important is that you be very conscious of the mental steps you're going through as you approach and absorb this information. And it begins to change the way you, uh, you receive not just information, but other people's opinions. It begins to change the way you read news stories. It begins to change the way that you understand uh, broadcasts. It really does begin to retrain your mind in the classical tradition. And I think that's interesting uh, about reading because 
and we talk about in our culture that we are we say that we're a literate society. People can read. Right. Um, but literacy, the way you're, it sounds like you're defining it, is more than just being able to read uh, words. It's actually understanding and doing something with, or being more active with your reading, I guess. Yeah, I like that phrase, active reading. That's really good. Um, our schools, not everyone knows this, but our schools are designed to turn out students who read on what's called the 10th grade literacy level, which essentially means you can read and you don't have a problem with reading. Um, what the 10th grade literacy level doesn't really teach us is how to read actively, how to engage with and think critically about texts. So yeah, I mean, as a, as, a, as a nation, we have a very high 10th grade literacy level. I think we have a relatively low, um, we'll call it the classical literacy level. Um, you know, it, we, we, have a, we have a much lower number of people who are able to really grab onto information through reading and, and have that make a difference in the way they think. Right. And I, I mean, I imagine it's gotten harder uh, with the Internet. You know, it, I feel like the Internet has fostered this too long, didn't read mentality, right, um, where people just want the summary and then make their opinion based off of that. Uh, so you have to be uh, very proactive about this. And like, I mean, like, I like how you you call your first book a well-trained mind because you are training your mind. I mean, it is a, it is a mental workout when you read like this. Yeah. Yes. And, and I do think you have to be very deliberate about it. You have to be very intentional. But you know what? The internet hasn't changed that. That's always been true. If you go back and you look at um, the journals of people who were self-educating themselves in the 18th and the 19th century, you see them consciously deciding to learn how to think and to read in a certain way and sort of going out and getting that for themselves because it hasn't just been given to them. So I think there's always been this intentionality in learning how to read and to think properly. And although the internet, you know, is a wonderful distraction, the world has always been full of things that could pull you away from that process of reading and thinking. Now it's the internet. You know, a hundred years ago, it was the pub. There's always something else to do that seems more fun, but you have to have that determination that there's something here that I want to get for myself and I'm going to do it. So what should we be reading for, you know, to... To, if we're taking this classical, if we want to catch ourselves up on this classical education, uh, suggested books, just a few. I know you you get in very detailed uh, about in your book, uh, well educated in mind, but some suggestions or genres that people should look to to uh, peruse and start reading deliberately with. You know, well, I always suggest that if people are super super um, uncertain about their reading abilities, that they start with novels because stories have this sort of. Um, intrinsic forward motion that pulls you along and so it's it's just a good starting place so if you were to read great novels um sort of chronologically which is what i always suggest because then you start to see the development of the genre over time you might want to start with don quixote which is generally thought to be it's considered to be the first novel in the modern sense um, and I always tell people, you really don't have to read the 800-page unabridged version. There's some really great abridged versions out there. That's one of those books that you can read it in an abridged form, and you'll still get what you need out of it. Um, but then you can then move forward through uh, the 18th and 19th century novelists, through Dickens and Jane Austen, for example, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, on into the 20th century masters. So we think about sort of bridging the 19th and 20th centuries, maybe Stephen Crane, and then on into the 20th century, you know, we're talking about Hemingway and Dostoevsky, um, and then all the way up to the present. When I did this chronological list of great novels in The Well-Educated Mind, they started with Don Quixote, and I ended with Cormac McCarthy's The Road. And what you see there is this whole, like, three centuries, four centuries, really, of writers using the image of a journey along a road to an unknown destination in order to say something very profound about how human beings function. So that's the sort of thing you want to do. The truth is it, it doesn't matter so much which novels you choose to read. 
And let me quickly qualify that. I'm not saying that reading Stephen King um, is going to do the trick for you, but there are so many great lists online of great books of both um, both ancient, medieval, Renaissance, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century classics. If you take those lists and select titles off them and read chronologically through them, you will begin to retrain your mind. Right. And again, you're, you're applying that uh, three, that three part pattern. The first time you, so the first time you might just read through the entire novel without stopping, getting a gist of the story. Uh, and then you might, that's like the grammar level. And then the next level would be starting to analyze it a bit more. Yes, exactly. And you know, actually that first step, just reading through without stopping can be really hard for people because I think many people learned in school to sort of read a bit and then stop and decide what you think and then read a bit and stop and decide what you think. And that makes it very, very difficult, first of all, to get all the way through a book because it's, it's really, you know, halts your momentum. Um, and it's also a bad mental habit to start making conclusions about something before you finish it. Um, but, but also, uh, that habit sort of, um, it, it keeps you from getting absorbed in the book, from really experiencing it, from really entering into the author's vision. So on your first read through, you almost suspend that critical faculty. You just try to immerse yourself in the book. And then once you have the whole picture, you know, the book from beginning to end, then you go back and you start to ask some critical questions about it. Um, you know, if you're working with a novel, you might just begin with the very basic, all right, who's, who's the main character? Who's the protagonist? What does the protagonist want? And how does he set out to get it? And this seems like a really simple question. Um, but it, it's, it's not that simple a question. If you're thinking about something like Cormac McCarthy's The Road and, you know, the protagonist is this unnamed character and I'm going to do this without trying to give away too much about the book because it's a really great read. Um, what does the protagonist want? Well, the protagonist wants to stay alive. You know, that's really basic. But then you always ask yourself, what does the protagonist really want? What are the motivations behind staying alive? What is, what is the protagonist trying to accomplish by staying alive? And there are a set of much more interesting and deeper answers to that. You know, this is a world where a lot of people have actually just given up and died. So you need to say, why is it so important for this character to stay alive? Then you start to really understand what Cormac McCarthy is saying about the human and then I always tell people that the third step, after you've gone back and asked a bunch of critical questions, and I've suggested a number actually in the book, um, and you can also, parentheses, go to something like um, uh, Cliff's Notes online and use some of the critical questions that they offer for various classics if you need help thinking about what questions to ask. Then it's really good if you can talk to someone else about the book. That's sort of the rhetoric stage. You find a reading buddy or a friend or, you know, or even an online discussion group, as long as people are expressing themselves um, well and coherently and not in fragments. And you explain what you've learned from the book in your own words. Uh, one of the things you learn in a graduate education is that um, you don't really know what you think about a book until you have told someone else in actual words, either in writing or, or in a discussion. Until you actually put your ideas into words, they still remain um, unformed or partially formed. You may think you know what you think about a book, but until you have said it, you haven't finished formulating those thoughts. So that sort of leads you through those grammar, logic, and, uh, and rhetoric stages of thinking. I love it. And I love that suggestion of finding a reading buddy, even online, because uh, you talk about it in your book as well, is that this is very common for people back in the 18th, 19th centuries. They would, you know, the founding fathers would have letters amongst each other where they just discussed, uh, you know, a piece of like a Cicero or you know, some other Roman, you know, Livy or something like that. Exactly. This was a huge part of their own intellectual development was to talk to other people who were developing the same, um, the same background, you know, the same basic information, and to express ideas to each other.
Yeah. And I, and I love the suggestion too, of starting with something you enjoy. Um, and cause I, one, like a few years ago, I decided, you know, I'm going to get through the, the entire great book series. And I started plowing through it from starting at the Iliad and I, I was doing great. And then I got to, uh, I think it was Aristotle's like, you know, his discourse on syllogisms. And I was just like, yeah, I lost steam. And I, I just abandoned ship on the project. Well, you know, not everyone, not everyone thinks philosophically in a way that's going to make that a useful book. I think a lot of us came out of school with the sense that if you're really doing something intellectually worthwhile, it's going to be really unpleasant. You know, it, it's, it's going to be so hard. You're going to have to make yourself do it. You got to put a hair shirt on, right? Yes, exactly. Well, I think it is sort of, you know, it is sort of a Calvinistic leftover uh, in a lot, a lot of Americans, particularly Protestants. Um, although, you know, Catholics have their own, their own tradition of doing things you don't want to do. So, but we really do, a lot of us have this sense of if it's good for me, I can't possibly like it, you know, sort of the broccoli mentality. And that's not true. One, especially once you get to be an adult, things that fascinate you are things that you should cultivate and you can use those topics, those subjects, those genres in order to develop your thought. If poetry isn't your thing, read science. You know, read the great books of science um, and think critically about those. Don't feel like you've got to plow through, um, you know, Homer or or Aristotle for that matter. Right. Yeah, I, I enjoyed Homer and I enjoyed the the Greek tragedies. <laughs> it's just yeah, I remember I just getting to the syllogisms where I was like, okay, no, I can't do this. Um, so what do you tell the person who's like, yeah, I want to do this, but then they look at everything they've missed and like what they have to do to get caught up, even if they just, you know, pick a genre they enjoy, say science, and they're like, I want to start way, you know, go back to um, the Greeks and see what they thought. It can be kind of overwhelming. And they're thinking, man, I don't have very much life to live. How am I going to get this all done before I die? Um, so any suggestions or advice on not feeling overwhelmed about the prospect of acquiring a classical education. Yeah, well, that is a, that is a really great point, and and it sort of leads us to understand something about our culture. Um, you know, every every society has its own sort of internal ethic; those things which it finds to be good and worthwhile, and, and those things which it finds to be you know not so good and worthwhile. And a lot of times, you can you can get a clue as to what this ethic is through the language that we use. And one of the things that has always struck me, particularly in talking to people about educating themselves, is the extent to which we use um, fast to mean good and slow to mean bad. So, you know, if we, if we talk about computers or fast food places, the one that is really, really fast is, is the good computer or the good fast food place. And the one that takes longer to process or to get you your burger is the bad one. And, you know, we, we should think seriously about that. It's not really normative to use these value words, good and bad, about fast and slow. But because we live in a capitalistic economy in which doing more and faster um, is more profitable, we have come to identify quantity and speed with virtue. And that would have been totally foreign to the ancients. Actually, it would have been totally foreign to most thinkers prior to the Industrial Revolution. So when we're thinking about educating ourselves, I think we have to start to let go of this. I'm, you know, this, this, I'm not going to be able to do this well. You see, I'm going to do it badly because I'm not going to be able to read that many books and I'm not going to be able to do them quickly. Um, quantity and speed should not be our measure of how well we are doing something like reading the great books. The truth is that what, whichever of the great books you read and however many of them you get through, you're studying the human condition. Um, many times you're studying the same conclusions about the human condition expressed in a different way or from a different angle. But what you have to realize is that Understanding the human condition is not something that, um, and, and, you know, it's not like making a widget. It's not like something that you finish and, oh, look, I achieved it. I'm done. Um, it's, it's a lifelong process. And everyone 
goes through that process in a different way and hits different milestones of understanding at a different time. How many of the great books you read should not even be a question. The question is, are you spending time thinking deeply about these great ideas and what they say about humanity? You've got to let go of speed and quantity. And that, and that actually, it, to me, is a big part of the self-education process. It's letting go of the need to reach milestones at any particular time. And listen, if you've been through K-12, and particularly then if you've been through college, and certainly if you've been through graduate school, that's so hard to let go of because learning has always been associated in your mind with deadlines and with um, earning, quote unquote, degrees. You have to get a certain amount of stuff done by a certain time, and then you are more educated. That, you gotta let go of. Yeah, and as you were saying that, it made me think about the the analogy to the great conversation of you know, in, in my own life, like actual conversations I've had with people, really good ones. You never finish it. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like yeah. you might you might you might have this great talk, and then they have to leave, and you're not done. Mm -hmm. And it, you, I don't feel bad. I like that was really good. I enjoyed that, and we pick it up. You know, maybe a month later. Exactly, and I think instead, many of us have learned to think of conversation um, as if you know you're 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 going to the doctor and you have 15 minutes to tell them everything you need to and then your time's up. Um, but, but that's not how learning is. Um, so we, we've talked about, uh, you know, educating ourselves if we're an adult. Um, and I, I highly recommend people to go check out her book, Well-Educated Mind. Uh, she gives some really great suggestions on books that you should check out and suggestions on how to approach them. But let's talk about uh, your first book, A Well-Trained Mind. Um, where it's geared towards parents who want to provide their children with a classical uh, education uh, at home. Uh, you know, it's kind of geared towards homeschoolers. I'm curious, um, is it possible for parents who can't homeschool, maybe both parents work, or there's a single family home, uh, and so they have to send their kids to either a private school or a public school, uh, to apply these principles and maybe supplement their public education with uh, the principles in a well-trained mind to give their child a classical education? Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, you know, when we when we did the first edition of that book in, in 1999, we were thinking primarily of home educators. But what we found in the last, you know, 15, 16 years is that there are so many parents out there who are doing what they call after-schooling which is they're, you know, picking one or more subject in which they feel that, that, you know, the school's just not quite doing it for them or the child has a real gift and they want to move on, do more. And they use the principles um, in our book to just do supplemental education, you know, in one or two subjects. And it, it's really a matter of um, feeling like you have the ability and the authority to take control of your child's education to not just say, all right, whatever the school gives us, that's what we're going to take. But, okay, what the school gives us, we're gonna take. But as good as the school may be, my child has these very individual gifts and talents and needs, and I have these ambitions for my child, and so we're gonna do a little extra work. Sometimes people work over the summer a little bit, sometimes they do a little bit of after school work. A lot of school districts will work with you if you want to sort of take over one subject and teach it yourself, as long as you know, you're willing to provide them with documentation that you're doing it well. There are any number of sort of innovative, um, innovative approaches that you can take to really putting your hands on your child's education and saying, I'm going to give it a little twist, a little push in this direction, because I think that's what will really benefit my child. So uh, you get really specific um, in the book, and you divide a child's learning life, right, his grade school life, into the, the three parts, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric part. Let's just focus on the grammar part because, um, you know, I'm kind of there with my kids. They're three and five years old. Um, what, could, what should parents be doing now uh, with their children if they have young kids to lay a foundation for them so they can have a, a great learning life, not only in their school years, but in their adult life as well? Well, I think with, with, um, with young children, you're thinking to yourself, literacy, 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 literacy. And here are the, 
I, I like to think of this as having sort of three separate, three separate aspects. The first is making sure that they read well, they read as early as they're able to, they read often, that reading becomes a habit for them. And often that means um, yourself taking on the task of teaching them basic phonics so that they can begin to sound out words and uh, begin to crack that code and you know have the world of books open to them. Many classrooms do a good job with phonetic instruction. Um, many do not do a good job with phonetic instruction. And also what classrooms tend to do is they tend to tie reading and handwriting together for kids. So even if they're learning phonics, they'll learn how to sound out, you know, a, a combination of letters, but then they learn how to write it at the same time. And the problem with this is that most young children are ready to read long before they're ready to do a lot of handwriting. The fine motor muscles just take longer to develop. And a lot of kids start to associate reading, which they could do easily and enjoyably if they were allowed to, with this struggle that they have getting words down on paper. And it's one of the reasons why boys tend to struggle with the language arts curriculum in elementary school more than girls, because it is just a biological fact that those fine motor muscles develop more slowly in boys. Um, so we can really help, particularly our little boys, um, develop a love for reading by teaching them how to read phonetically outside of the classroom and without demanding that they learn how to write all the sounds at the same time. Um, does, does that make sense? That's, that makes perfect sense. I mean, when should you introduce writing? Because, like, yeah, my son, uh, you know, he started reading really young. I don't know why. It was bizarre. Like, it freaked my wife and I out. Um, but, like, his writing's atrocious. Um, so at what point should you start, like, incorporating writing practice with your kids? Or boys. And by the way, what you describe is just the most typical, it's, it, that is the most typical developmental um, arc ever. I see it all the time. And, you know, it's really important with your little boy that you, you praise what they do well and don't think, oh, but look at all this catching up you have to do over here, um, which is so easy to do. But, you know, that to the side. You should start doing, doing just phonics with them as soon as they show interest in the printed page. With writing... Really, they should be practicing just handwriting, not composition, just handwriting, practicing the letters for five or 10 minutes a day, starting when they're maybe five years old. But in terms of actual um, original composition, that is actually more of an eight, nine, and 10-year-old um, enterprise. In the, in the traditional classical curriculum, students pretty much just copied up until they were nine or 10 years old. And what that did was it filled their minds with great language because they were copying the words of other writers. It filled their minds with vocabulary. It exposed them to all these different written styles. And it gave their little hands a chance to develop. And in, in many classrooms, uh, composition exercises, even long ones, even like five paragraph essays, are pushed all the way back into the elementary grades and are introduced to students at a time that is just completely developmentally inappropriate. And that can really sour kids on writing. Um, again, a lot of little girls can do it because they're just their muscles are a little better developed, but it just has the potential to discourage students who just, you know, physically aren't quite there yet in a way that's so unnecessary. So one of the ways in which you can protect your child's literacy is to be kind of hard-nosed with the teacher about it. Um, you know, if a teacher's hard-nosed in the nicest possible way, if the teacher is sending home, and I've seen this often, five paragraph essays for third graders and research papers for fourth graders, I think it's our role as parents to say, uh, no, wait, hold the phone, you know, this is discouraging my child. My child is going to give up on language because they're so overwhelmed. So being very sensitive to frustration. And when you're dealing with an elementary student, if the student cries or gets angry, that always means that they're, well, almost always means that they're struggling with something that's developmentally inappropriate. They don't even know how to express to you why they can't do it because they haven't yet developed that kind of vocabulary, what you get is non-verbal response. So always look out for tears and always look out for anger and be willing as the parent to say to the teacher, 
my child needs a little more time to mature before we do this. It's, it's a very difficult mindset to develop, but I think it's so important. If we want our kids to go through their K-12 education and come out the other end still excited about reading and writing, we have to really step up and be their advocates when they're being asked to do something that isn't actually going to move them towards that goal. With with the reading, do we encourage our kids to read things they want to read, or should we maybe subtly introduce some of those great books that are based on like on a child's level, like maybe throw in some Odyssey or you know a child's version of it or something like that? Yeah, well, we do both. We don't have to. We don't have to do an either or approach to this. Um, I, when I when I said there were three ways in which you could develop your child's literacy, we just talked about the first. The second I was going to say is to help them develop a much more advanced vocabulary. And one of the best ways to do this is to make a habit of, of for your kid and for both of you together of listening to unabridged audiobooks on tape or on whatever, MP3s. Because yeah. what that allows students to do is to immerse themselves in a story which is still above their reading level. But, but which isn't beyond their comprehension level. And that pulls them towards a more mature level of reading. They're not yet technically able to read this work for themselves, but in listening to it, they gain greater vocabulary. You know, building their vocabularies is huge. And they start to develop um, a knowledge of complex sentence structure. So the listening moves them towards greater achievement in reading. So we let them read what they want. We encourage them to read children's versions of classics that they might not otherwise pick up on themselves. And we encourage them to listen to actual unabridged audiobooks that are on a slightly more difficult level than what they feel comfortable with. And all of those things move kids towards maturity. Yeah, my, my son and I have been listening to The Trumpet of the Swan on, his, on the way to school. And it's great because it's actually narrated by E.B. White. Yes, and, and his, his Charlotte's Web, which he also narrates, is just the most beautiful book. Yeah, yeah. He's got such a soothing, calm voice. Yes, it's wonderful. yes he does. Um, let's, uh, let's, can you tell us about the Well-Trained Mind Academy? Because that seems to pick up you know, after this uh, first you know, couple of years of, of education. Uh, you actually have an online curriculum, correct, at the Well-Trained Mind? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. We do. I'd love to tell you about that. It just occurs to me that I didn't tell you about the third thing we can do to develop literacy. Can I tell you that? Let's go back to it. Yeah, and then we'll go back to it. Yeah, sure. Well, we just we just don't want to forget this. The third really important thing to do is to develop kids' um, numeracy, which is you know mathematical literacy. I think it's easy, particularly if you're not a maths-oriented person, to forget that a big part of what you want to be doing with your elementary student is not just working with them with their arithmetic assignments, but doing your best to make mathematical thinking part of everyday life. And what that means is, with really little kids, counting with them, doing number pairing, you know, um, I'm going to get, I'm going to get pieces of chicken for dinner. There are five of us. How many pieces of chicken should I get? I should get five, that sort of thing. And then also making uh, mathematical picture books and, and just math books generally part of what we expose the child to and part of what the child does for entertainment. Don't forget that numbers are another language and students need to be just as literate in numbers as, as in, you know, the alphabet as, and, and words. So I just want to, you know, put that out there as something for parents to think about. Perfect. Um, so let's go back, uh, talking about the well-trained mind Academy. I mean, what's there, what kind of resources can parents find there to help, uh, provide their children a classical based education? Right. Well, this is one of the ways in which, again, I love the term neoclassical because it means that you take what is best from the past, but you, you know, you can also combine it with the best of the present. Um, online education can be a really wonderful delivery tool, meaning that the, it gives students the chance to, um, to access expert teaching um, without having to be you know, geographically near the teacher. So what we're attempting to do um, with, with the Well-Trained Mind Academy, and you know, so far we've just been so pleased with the response and how it's going, 
is to offer live online instruction where in, in, in all of the core areas of the curriculum where teachers who have a commitment to classical education and who have training in it um, teach students in a very traditional manner. It's just that the computer is the delivery system. So there are live lectures, there's conversations. We actually have a great Socratic dialogue class um, online, which has been super, super popular. There are written assignments, traditional written assignments, which are uploaded you know, to the Blackboard site that the student is using and then that get, gets feedback from the teacher. So it's really the best of traditional classical instruction um, what the computer does is it allows us to, you know, um, take the distance out of the process. So we have classes for um, middle school and high school in the core areas of the curriculum. Um, we don't offer classes for elementary students because I believe very strongly that elementary students who are still um, at a very basic level of learning what social interaction is about, learning how to read people, learning how to interpret tone of voice, et cetera, should receive the majority of their instruction face to face. But for the middle grades on, uh, we do offer uh, classes that incorporate these principles that I've been talking about. Fantastic. Well, Susan Weisbauer, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's been so nice to talk to you. My guest today was Susan Wise Bauer. You can find her books, uh, The Well-Educated Mind and The Well-Trained Mind on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. And you can find more information about her work at SusanWiseBauer.com. And if you are a parent and would like more information about online classical education, check out The Well-Trained Mind Academy at WTMAcademy.com. And... Also, like I said earlier in the show, be sure to check out the show notes for this podcast for links to all the resources we mentioned in the show at aom.is slash Bauer. Again, that's spelled B-A-U-E-R, so aom.is slash Bauer.